Good morning. Welcome to Franklin Christian Church's pre-recorded worship service today. We're so glad you are tuning in and watching from wherever you may be today. This is our second week of doing a pre-recorded service online as we are in between our old campus and new campus. So you may be watching this today um, on Sunday morning or later throughout the week, but we're glad that you are worshiping with us. And if you are in the Franklin area and you want to worship in person for these next couple of months as we wait on the completion of our building, which is happening in early March, we're meeting every Sunday, 1030 a.m. in Franklin at the Williamson County Performing Arts Center. If you want the information about the address and uh, upcoming ministry events that are going on these next couple of months, FCCTN.org is the best place to find all information about things going on at our church. Once again, we're glad you're watching today. We're going to start things off by singing some worship songs together, and we hope that you'll join us in singing today. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things Oh, hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh, God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom
church family. We're going to move into our time of communion now. And so as we do this, we invite all of you, if you haven't already, to go ahead and prepare the communion elements with whatever you have available to you. If you want to pause the video, uh, if you haven't done that and, and go and prepare those, then resume uh, the video. You're welcome to do that. I'm going to read a few verses this morning from uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We invite all who follow Jesus to join us in this communion meal as we eat the bread representing Christ's body broken for us, as we drink the juice representing Christ's blood that was shed for us, we experience the love of God around his communion table and we proclaim that Christ's death offers us life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus who willingly went to the cross and gave up his life so that we could have life in you. We give you thanks for that sacrifice. We remember what Christ has done and we ask that you would make us more like him so that we could love others as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, FCC family. As we move into a time of offering, we're going to share a quick word together. Just remember that the ways to give will be listed on the screen below you. 
Today we're going to take a peek into Luke 16, a parable that Jesus is teaching to crowds of people and Pharisees. So Jesus is teaching in the parable in Luke 16 about the shrewd manager. We're not going to talk a lot about that actual parable. We're going to talk more about the conclusion that Jesus reaches from that parable. We're going to start in, in verse 13. And Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now the Pharisees who loved money heard this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. That's a convicting word from Jesus right there. To the Pharisees and to us. Can we truly serve true masters? What are things that we value highly that may be detestable in God's sight? What we know for sure is that Jesus is very clear that we cannot serve God and money. So let us serve God by allowing him to use our money for his purposes. Let's pray. Dear Lord, forgive us for trying to serve you and money. We know that that can't be done. God, help us surrender our money and resources to you so that you can use them for the advancement of your kingdom, for your purposes and your glory. Bless this offering for your purposes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want you 
nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else. Last week, we began a study series on the Lord's Prayer. And I think that appropriate because, number one, it's the beginning of the year. And number two, we are patiently waiting for God to open the doors to our new building, which will be sometime in March. So as we begin today, we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer. We did that last week. We're going to do it every study of this series. So would you bow with me? and pray the Lord's Prayer. We'll use the King James Version. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The word kingdom appears over 150 times in the New Testament. One-third of those are in the book of Matthew. However, there is not one single verse in this passage that, that actually defines kingdom. It is a very important word, yet We have no clear definition, only many passages where Jesus describes it with parables and word pictures. Now, speaking as a minister, the good thing about the lack of clarity is that whatever I say, you can't prove me wrong. (laughs) Ha ha. But we're going to move on seriously as we study this passage and ask, what do we know about the coming kingdom? God's kingdom is vastly different from all the other world kingdoms. All earthly kingdoms have limited power that tends to decline with age. Babylon and Assyria were incredibly powerful kingdoms in Bible times, and yet they've been lost to history. The magnificent Roman Empire is left in rubble throughout Europe. The British Empire no longer rules the oceans. Kingdoms rise and fall, but God's kingdom never ends. 
the psalmist wrote, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. So for what are we praying when we say the words, Your kingdom come? Essentially, we pray, God, you're the ruler of heaven and earth. May your rule increase and be established in the hearts and the minds of everyone in this world, now and in your coming eternal kingdom. The problem is, it's even more personal than that. When we pray, your kingdom come, we invite Jesus himself to rule in our lives. Take the throne of my life, Lord. Be present in my heart. Be present in my workplace. Lead my marriage. Be Lord of my family, Lord of my fears, Lord of my doubts. And that is no small request. We are praying that God will occupy and rule over every corner of our lives. Now this kingdom, God's kingdom, carries huge implications to our salvation, to the church, even to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. The kingdom belongs to Jesus because Jesus is the one who died for our sins on the cross so that we could enter this kingdom. The concept of God ruling over our lives, I know it's very foreign to many people today. Our arrogance and our pride, they stand in direct opposition to following and obeying God. We proudly hold up our education, our accomplishments, our possessions, our position, our power. And we sing the King, uh, excuse me, we sing the, the Frank Sinatra ballad, I Did It My Way, and we clearly ignore God, His leading, His direction. Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar bragged to himself one day, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Now, the pagan king is pretty proud of himself, but his pride offended God. Keep on reading. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. God does not reward pride. He does not ignore our disobedience. His throne, His power, His name deserves our respect. You may have heard the old adage, if you aren't a liberal by the time you are 20, you have no heart. And if you're not a conservative by the time you are 40, you have no brain. Well, we smile at that, but those, uh, those political philosophies are set aside when we're thinking about God's eternal kingdom. Because the ultimate issue is not who is in the White House or who controls Congress or which generation sets culture. The highest issue, the most important issue, is always God's kingdom. God already rules the universe. Whether nations, political leaders, or culture acknowledge Him or not. Years ago, I heard a radio minister quote a Bible verse. It was a verse, even though I was young, that I had read dozens of times, but it never clicked. It never connected. So when I got back to the office, I, I looked up that verse, and I learned something new about God. He can whistle. Did you know that? He can whistle. Isaiah 
chapter 5, he lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come, swiftly and speedily. Do you see the power of God here? He whistles for nations as one would whistle for a dog, and they come running. Remember that power. Remember that verse when any political entertainment or science leader claim great wisdom and authority. Remember that verse when people claim that there is no God. Remember that verse when you are fearful of the future. Because each time you hear arrogance and pride, say the Lord's Prayer, emphasizing His kingdom, and then whistle. Because one day, God will whistle back, and the world will know it. I think a real question that you have to answer is this one. Are you a member of God's kingdom, a citizen of God's kingdom? Jesus told Nicodemus, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. No one can see the kingdom of God for what it really is or enter the kingdom without this new birth, literally a, a, a spiritual birth from above. It's not just new in time, it's also new in nature. It is a heavenly spiritual birth. And it's brought into existence by earthly acts of faith, repentance, baptism, a changed life. God works a miracle in that a transformation takes place in an individual life. So perhaps the important question is not, do you have the Holy Spirit? Maybe it should be, does the Holy Spirit have you? Does the Holy Spirit possess you? Does the Holy Spirit lead you? Jesus said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If that means acting childish, some of us already have it made. What it really means, though, is that unless you humble yourself, and unless your heart is innocent, unless you are accepting, you will never see or truly understand or even enter the kingdom of God. There is no place for pride or arrogance in God's family. This is not kingdom living. Kingdom living is a paradigm shift in lifestyle. It's an often dramatic, exciting, powerful, complete, unreserved, full-blown transformation where we shift our hearts and our loyalties and our priorities from an earthly focus to a heavenly one. That powerful change motivates us to pray more for non-kingdom people who need to know the Lord. Now those of you who are watching at home, we are meeting in PAC, which is the Performing Arts Center of Franklin, Tennessee. And the reason we're doing that, as we mentioned last week, and as you may have read on our website, we're not in our building yet and will not be until sometime in March. But we are preparing to engage in ways that we want to reach the temporary neighborhood, our temporary neighborhood, for Jesus Christ. We're here for a short time, but we want to make that time count. We know that God has given us this new campus, which we hope to enter into, as I said, in March. But until then, we continue to pray for the people in Franklin. The building is not the goal. Transformation and transformed lives, that's the goal. Now, you have been praying for our new campus. You've been praying for the supply issues that we have mentioned that have slowed things down a bit, which has COVID at its root cause. You know that. It's happening all over the world, not just with churches, but every business. And we all have to deal with it in some way. There's a glass shortage right now. I've mentioned that before. Many call it a crisis because Jack Daniels can't get glass bottles for their favorite beverage. It's affecting everybody. 
I mentioned trouble getting glass for our building. And some of you prayed for glass. I know you did. I heard you pray for it. And I'm happy to tell you that all our glass is in. God provided that. And it's, it's being installed as we know it. Some of you also prayed for the audiovisual systems, for the kids and the student worship rooms, because we were told that they wouldn't be in by the time that we opened. And we were trying to figure out what to do and, and how we're going to do this without the, uh, without the audiovisual equipment. And some of you prayed for that. And an amazing thing happened. There was a church who was building a building, and it got delayed, and so they had to redo their contract for this audiovisual system. And when Brandon saw the specs, he realized that's exactly what we needed, exactly what we needed. And now we're getting the equipment. It's already purchased, already on the way. There's so much more to do in that new auditorium and in the student ministry room. So I'm going to ask you, because you've seen prayers that are answered. God is hearing you pray, and He's answering those prayers. And do you think this prayer thing has something to do with it right now? I mean, it's working. So I want you to pray specifically for our auditorium and for the student ministry rooms. That's where we're a little behind. Well, a lot behind. That's what set us back to March. Pray specifically for those two rooms, for the concrete that needs to be poured, the risers that need to be completed, the glass that is being installed quickly so that we can get heat on in the building so that we can do other things such as paint the walls. So a lot of things are going on. A lot of dominoes are falling. Keep those prayers coming. And also, I want you to pray that God is preparing hearts to join His kingdom through our ministry. Following Jesus' ascension into heaven, the apostles gathered in an upstairs room in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. It wouldn't surprise me that at some point in time in that meeting, somebody prayed the Lord's Prayer or a variation of it, and maybe they said, Your kingdom come. Because did it ever come? 3,000 people accepted Jesus and were added to the kingdom. God can save by ones and twos, but He also also can save by hundreds and thousands. And I believe with all my heart there was a connection between the prayer meeting in Acts 1 and the baptisms in Acts 2. Something always happens when God's people pray. And something amazing is going to happen at, at at Franklin Christian Church in 2022 if God's people pray like they've never prayed before. And I'm going to ask you to pray those prayers. Some people don't believe that, I know. But that might be because they don't understand God's kingdom. It is a kingdom grounded in grace, not works. It is a kingdom grounded in love, not legalism. It is a kingdom that is open to all, not just a few When we pray, thy kingdom come, it's not wishful thinking. It's a call to action for the church of Jesus Christ. It's a call to action from our church. And we have to take that seriously. So what is the end result of kingdom living? Well, there is a present time dynamic to the kingdom, what we call the church, but there is also a future dimension to the kingdom. Let me explain. After his arrest and while being questioned by the Roman Roman governor, this is what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus demonstrated this truth to the apostles that were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane while he was being arrested. Do you remember that? Peter pulled out his sword and he tried to whack off the heads of some of, these, uh, some of these people who had come to arrest Jesus. And of course, he was flailing and missed one guy's head completely and instead just cut off his ear. And Jesus shouted, and, and I am paraphrasing here, Peter, stop! Put your sword away! This is not how we do things in my kingdom. And Malchus, oh, by the way, I found your ear. Here, let me put it back for you. And he did. He performed an amazing miracle right there, but it didn't matter. They arrested him anyway. 
You see, Christ's kingdom is the very opposite of what we would expect, at least those who are caught up in this world. There is a present time dynamic to the church, which is as we worship and as we're together as the church. So a present dynamic to the kingdom, which we call the church, but there's a future dynamic. dynamic. And Jesus will one day announce to his followers, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. What is that inheritance? The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And what is this kingdom? It's the kingdom of heaven. We have no fear, for His kingdom is coming. Yes, we still live in a fallen world filled with sin, injustice, and temptation. But we do so while we're looking ahead to the unshakable, unseen, uncompromising, heavenly kingdom of God. Gladys was a member of my church that I served in Florida many years ago. She was 65 years old when she was diagnosed with ALS, commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a progressive neuromuscular illness, and it weakens and eventually destroys the motor neurons from the brain to the muscles. Your mind remains fine while your body slowly dies. Gladys lived across the church, uh, across the street from the church in an apartment. And so I would often walk across the street and sit down and visit her. And when she still had her ability to speak, she asked me all about heaven. She wanted to know what it was like. This was going to be her future home. What our bodies would look like and what we would do and who we would see. And even when she lost her ability to communicate except for her eyes, which would widen with joy whenever anybody came in to visit her, I would sit and I would share about heaven and I would read Bible passages. Her mind was fine, but her body was given up. And I saw it personally on my visits. And it hurt me. But it also gave me confidence in the fact she knew where she was going. A place where her body would remain whole and healthy for eternity. A place where there is no illness or death. And her body was still here on earth, but her heart her heart was already in heaven and her mind was imagining that wonderful place. She was still faithful to the kingdom. She did not possess many material goods, but then again, she didn't need them. James told us, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised those who love Him. It doesn't matter what you have as much as it does whom you love. Because if you love God and His Son Jesus, then an obedient life follows. Not a perfect life, but one out of obedience because we love Him. We do the right things not because we have to. We do them because we want to. That is our desire for all the people of this world. It is our desires specifically for the people in Franklin and Williamson County that through our ministry we can reach out, make a difference, find non-kingdom people, and welcome them through Jesus Christ into His kingdom. God bless you. I love you. Keep praying. Keep reading His Word. I'll see you next week.
Once again, thank you so much for tuning in to our pre-recorded service today. We hope you have been blessed and impacted by the word that has been taught, by the songs that have been sung, and by our times of communion and offering together. If you want to get in touch with any of our ministry staff, if you have questions about uh, making a decision to follow Christ, if you want to get involved with volunteering at our church, or if you just want to say hello, the best way to do that, shoot us an email, info at fcctn.org. And we'll get back with you really soon. And also go ahead and check out our church website, fcctn.org, to find out all information about our church. Until next week, we hope you have a blessed week, and we'll see you very soon.